Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our MCA Dolls webinar this morning, and thank you for all attending. We have a good amount of attendees today. I think it's around 400 of you have uh, said you'll be joining. So the pressure's on, I think, this morning for our speakers. We'll hopefully do a good job for you. Um, we just, I'll go through the agenda shortly, but to do a bit of housekeeping first, just to note that you're all on mute and your cameras are off. There is a question and answer box that you can put your questions in if you're not familiar with this platform. My esteemed colleague, Amy Clark, will be fielding the questions, but largely I expect some of them will be answered at the end. If we can answer them throughout, we will do. But just to flag that to you, there is also a feedback form that you can complete at the end. And I will remind you of that at the end as well. And we really, really appreciate the feedback that you can give. So that would be wonderful if you could complete that for us. The other thing that I must, must highlight is that we are soon approaching 10 years since the Cheshire West judgment. And the, whether we're celebrating, I don't know, but we're marking it, you'll notice in this agenda, and I'll just pull it up, that this is primarily focusing on Mental Capacity Act elements. We are going to be doing separate uh, dolls content for you specifically around that because of the uh, anniversary. So do look out for that from us as well. Now, in terms of the agenda for today, I will be discussing capacity and sexual relations along with my colleague, Ellie Maudsley, who is an associate in our Manchester office. Then we will hand over to Emma Pollard, who is a senior associate in our London office to discuss withdrawal of treatment cases involving children. And then last but no, by no means least, we will have Claire Christophilus from our Manchester office. who will be discussing COP applications, pitfalls and best practice. And I can imagine you are all very keen to know about that, seeing as it is a large part of our working together. And then finally, we will finish with the Q&A fielded by Amy. But as I've said, if we can answer during the presentations, we will do, but largely that will be towards the end. So I am going to start us off today uh, with capacity and sexual relations. And <clears throat> how this will work through this, myself and Ellie, is that I'm going to start by discussing the heart of this, which is the leading case of JB and the position that was defined by JP. And I will go through the lower court judgments and the judgment of the Supreme Court then Ellie will take over from me and she will be taking you through updates to case law and as things stand now. So, VJB, why this is so important is it was the first time the Supreme Court had looked in detail at what it means to lack capacity to make a decision. And this case made it to the Supreme Court because it hadn't, uh, the, the local authority in this case maintained that there was a hard edged legal question outstanding in relation to what information is relevant for the purposes of assessing the issue of capacity to consent to sexual relations. And this question in this case was said to be, does the information relevant to the decision with section, within section 3.1 of the MCA 2005 include the fact that the other person engaged in the sexual activity must be able to and does in fact from their words and conduct consent to such an activity which is quite a thing to consider so the position pre-jb had been developed over substantial case law and it was mrs justice roberts in this first decision who said that from looking at the case law the courts had incrementally included additional, been willing to include additional relevant information in these types of cases. So before we had JB, Mr. Justice Cobb in REB had attempted to set out the relevant information to be considered when assessing capacity for sexual relations. And this included 
the sexual nature and character of the act of sexual intercourse and the mechanics of the act, the reasonably foreseeable consequences of sexual intercourse, namely pregnancy, the opportunity to say no, i.e. to choose whether or not to engage in it, and the capacity to decide whether to give or withhold consent to sexual intercourse, that there are health risks involved, particularly the acquisition of sexually transmitted and transmissible infections, and that the risks of sexually transmitted infection can be reduced by taking of precautions such as the use of a condom. And that actually was appealed by the official solicitor at the time on the basis that the relevant information was going too far, but that was dismissed by the Court of Appeal. So that was what stood. So again, the fundamental question proposed within JB was whether he had to understand, be able to understand, use and weigh the information that any prospective sexual partner must be able to give and maintain consent. As we know, all cases within the Court of Protection could be, should be considered on the facts. So as I've said, I will give a brief overview of some of the factual make it, matrix of this case and work through those decisions of the lower courts and then addressing the decision of the Supreme Court. So at the time this was originally brought in 2019, JB was 36. He'd been living in supported residential placement since May 2014, and he was described as being subject to a comprehensive care plan, which imposed significant limitations on his, in his ability to function in, independently. And this was in particular with reference to his access to the community, where he lives, and in his contact with third parties and social media and internet. JB has a complex diagnosis of autism combined with impaired cognition. Throughout the course of the initial proceedings, JB had made it very plain that he'd wanted to find a girlfriend and to develop and maintain a relationship. But the restrictions that he was imp that were imposed on him limited his ability to socialise. And those restrictions were said to be primarily in place to prevent him from behaving in a sexually inappropriate manner towards women. Now, he'd never been charged of any criminal offence, but there was concern that if left alone, this could lead him to exposure to the criminal justice system and be a risk to potentially vulnerable females. So, ahead of the initial hearing, the local authority and official solicitor had reached agreement on the majority of issues that the declarations were being sought from the court on the capacity. However, the local authority did maintain that there was a position that there was no binding authority of the court on whether the information that needs to be understood included what I've suggested in terms of consent and that essentially without that being part of re the relevant information, that means that there's potential for a liability to, to breach the criminal law. Now, the official solicitor at this stage felt again, as they had done in Reby, that this was overly burdensome of a test. And they said it would raise the bar from a deliberately low level at which it had been set in order to avoid discriminating against vulnerable adults with learning disabilities and other cognitive challenges who, despite those challenges, should be entitled nevertheless to exercise one of the most basic and instinctive functions of a human existence. The official solicitor on behalf of JB also submitted that the Mental Capacity Act cannot and should not be used as a means of imposing on a protected party restrictions which are designed either to avoid the risk of criminal offending or the protection of the public at large. And they further went on with those submissions. Now, the judge at the first instance concluded that the relevant information did not include the fact that the other person was able to and did in fact consent. And the judge held that for the purpose of determining the fundamental capacity of an individual in relation to sexual information, sexual relations, the information relevant to the decision for the purposes of Section 3.1 of the MCA does not include information that, absent consent of a sexual partner, attempting sexual relations with another person is liable to breach the criminal law. And she granted the declaration sought 
that JB had, um, pursuant to Section 15, that JB had capacity, therefore, to consent in sexual relations. So following that, the local authority appealed, and this was heard in June 2020. The Court of Appeal allowed the appeal, um, and Lord Justice Baker delivered the lead judgment with full agreement of the other members of the court. And what was uh, particularly of interest in the appeal case is that he actually recast the decision as being a decision to engage in sexual relations rather than a decision to consent to. So he was looking at it, he, he changed the lens in that. And what he said was that when the decision is expressed in those terms, i.e. engage to rather than consent to, it becomes clear that the information relevant to the decision inevitably includes the fact that any person with whom P engages in sexual activity must be able to consent to such activity and does in fact consent to it. Sexual relations between human beings are mutual, mutually consensual. It is one of the many features that makes us unique and a person who does not understand the sexual relations must only take place when and only for as long as the other person is consenting is unable to understand a fundamental part of the information relevant to the, the decision whether or not to engage in such relations. So which is in complete contrast to the decision of Mrs. Justice Roberts. So then the court went on further and it discussed information that it considered that may be relevant to the decision to engage in sexual relations. And this was the sexual nature and character of the act of sexual intercourse, including mechanics, the fact that the other, other person must have capacity to consent and must in fact consent before and throughout, the fact that P can say yes or no to having sexual relations and is able to decide whether to give or withhold that consent, that a reasonably foreseeable consequence of sexual intercourse between a man and a woman is that the woman will become pregnant and that there are health risks, again, as I highlighted previously, in terms of acquisition of sexually transmitted and transmissible infections, and that that can be reduced by taking of precautions. Now, the may is important here, as this was added, as this discussion was had as to the relevant information could be tailored to the facts of a situation. It wasn't decided in this court, in this um, case, that the information could be tailored, as it said that this is something that could be looked at in full argument on another case. But in any event, this was the information laid out as that may be included in that decision making assessment. So the court therefore set aside the declaration made by the lower court that JB had capacity to consent to sexual relations and made an interim declaration that there was reason to believe he lacked capacity to engage. And the case was then sent back to Mrs. was then to go back to Mrs. Justice Roberts for that final determination. Now, after this, the official solicitor on behalf of JB appealed to the su Supreme Court. By this time, JB was 38 and he remained under the same care plan as he was at the outset of the proceedings, largely. So you can see how much time had taken for this to run through the court process. And the OS's challenge was that the Court of Appeal was incorrect to recast the matter as engaging instead of consenting to. And this was dismissed. And the Court of Appeal was agreed to. And the reason it was dismissed was that Lord Stevens stated that the terminology of a capacity to decide to engage in embraces both P's capacity to consent in it, to relations initiated by another party and P's capacity to understand that in relation to sexual relations initiated by P, the other party must be able to consent. So it was said to be a more all-encompassing term. Um, 
The second limb of appeal was the inclusion of the ability of the other person to consent. And it was argued on JB's behalf, similarly to the first instance, that this inappropriately extended the requisite information in order to protect the other person and members of the public. And this wasn't the purpose of the MCA, which was combined to the protection of P. And the protection of the public was the purpose of the criminal law. And such protection could also be obtained by making the sexual risk order. And the third limb of their appeal was that this created an impermissible difference with the criminal law, i.e. there's no scope in the criminal law for there to be such a requirement. And in criminal law, capacity to consent is only concerned with the understanding of the complainant. And the fourth and final limb was whether the Court of Appeal test is inconsistent with Article 8 of the Convention and Article 12.2 of the United Nations. Nations Convention. So, and we can see here from the slide, the appeal was dismissed. And Lord Stevens reiterated that the evaluation of JB's capacity to make the decision for himself is in relation to the matter of his engaging in sexual relations. The information that is relevant to that decision must have the is that the other person must have the ability to consent to the sexual activity and must in fact consent before and throughout and under section 31a he should be able to understand that information and under 31c should be able to use or weigh it as part of the decision making process and the supreme court held that normally the question in relation to sexual relations is whether the person has capacity to decide to engage in sexual relations and the information relevant to the decision again may include the mechanics the fact the other person must have the ability to consent and must consent before and throughout that p can say yes or no and is able to decide whether to give or withhold consent pregnancy is a reasonably foreseeable consequence of intercourse between a man and a woman and again the health risks involved including sexually transmitted infections so they really upheld largely what the court of appeal had um, set out within their judgment and the supreme court held that this will usually be this information will be considered on a generalized forward-looking basis so without reference to a specific partner unless that certain situation arose. So between a couple with a long-standing relationship, for example. And that is where we are at the moment in terms of, or we were from the Supreme Court decision in terms of relevant information that may be considered. And I'll now hand over to Ellie, who is going to bring us to up to date. Thank you, Ellie. Thanks, Rachel. So the first case we're gonna look at is uh, Hull City Council and KF. Uh, KF was a 34 year old woman with a condition of a genesis of the corpus callosum, which caused her to have a moderate learning disability. And she had an IQ of 49. She also had metastatic breast cancer, which had spread to her liver, lungs and spine. And despite chemotherapy, her prognosis was poor between about three and 18 months. Her ex-partner, um, had sexually assaulted KF in the past and there were also concerns that he had physically, emotionally and also financially abused her. Her ex-partner previously encouraged her to have sex with other men but then became angered that one of those men had had anal sex with her and he fisted her which caused tears to her vagina requiring hospitalisation without which she could have died. They separated, but she returned to live with him and further violence was perpetrated. Um, so she eventually moved to a care home placement. Her ex-partner pleaded guilty to committing grievous bodily harm and was soon to be sentenced, but was um, at the time of the case on unconditional bail. Uh, KF wanted to spend one last night with her ex-partner before he was due to be imprisoned for causing her grievous bodily harm. And given the absence of bail conditions, whether this could happen depended upon her capacity to make the relevant decisions. Um, and if not, 
whether unsupervised overnight contact was in her best interests. So that was a decision the court had to um, consider. Uh, KF met remotely with the judge and expressed her hope that her wishes would come true to have some alone time with her partner in a private room. She also expressed this to the expert that was instructed in this case. Uh, the judge considered that it was possible to frame this decision to spend unsupervised overnight time with KW as a contact decision or a sexual relations decision, but that both needed to be considered. The judge observed that it's difficult to see how a person who lacks capacity to decide to have contact with a specific person could have capacity to engage in sexual relations with that person as sexual intimacy is a form of contact with another. Uh, and it was clear in this case that KF lacked capacity to decide on contact with her partner. Uh, the judge said that it's really important that the Court of Protection doesn't approach questions of capacity in silos. He said that he would regard it as incoherent to find that KF did not have capacity to decide to meet KW alone for a meal in a restaurant, but did have capacity to decide to have sexual relations with him. So decisions about capacity must be coherent and allow those responsible for caring for and for safeguarding KF to make pr practical arrangements. He went on to say, in cases which, in which it's been determined that P lacks capacity to make decisions about contact with a past or potential partner because of the risk of harm to P or by P, and it has been determined that P has capacity to decide to engage in sexual relations, consideration should be given to P's capacity to decide to engage in sexual relations with that partner. And that failure to do so could result in incoherent capacity decisions. So he said that it was right to consider capacity to engage in sexual relations as a person-specific issue in this case. Ultimately, the judge found KF to lack capacity to engage in sexual relations with her ex-partner, but he did say that she demonstrated generic capacity. Uh, he, he concluded this decision because she had not retained the information about the previous abuse from her partner. Uh, she couldn't weigh up the risks of further assault or harm being caused to her and the degree of those risks or any consequences from the same. In terms of best interests, it wasn't felt that it was in her best interest to have unsupervised overnight contact in a hotel room with her partner but it was in her best interest to continue to have supervised contact during the day and in a public place where they could kiss and cuddle with the support workers nearby. So this case demonstrates a bit more of a nuanced, nuanced approach to sexual relations that can be taken following the Supreme Court's decision in JB. Uh, the approach being to focus on contact first and then a person specific take on sexual relations. The next case we're going to look at concerns PN. Uh, PN was a 34 year old man who had a diagnosis of mild learning disability and autistic spectrum disorder. There was no dispute in this matter in relation to his diagnosis or his lack of capacity to uh, conduct proceedings or make decisions in relation to his residence care, contact with others and use of the internet and social media. <clears throat> The issues before the court was whether PN had capacity in relation to three issues. The first, whether he can make decisions about engaging in sexual relations. Secondly, whether he can make decisions about disclosing information about the risk of sexual harm he posed to others. And finally, about the local authority, uh, about allowing the local authority to disclose information about the risk of sexual harm they, he posed to others. So for a bit of background, PN had a history of sexual offending, which included incidents of sexual touching without consent and inappropriate comments towards women. Uh, the judge noted in this case that most of these acts were opportunistic and there was no evidence that PN had ever committed rape or had sexual intercourse um, without consent. Um, PN's ability to make decisions regarding sex appears to have been considered over a period of years by a number of professionals. The evidence appeared to be consistent, uh, 
um, that he didn't understand what sexual assault and consent were. Sorry, that he did understand what sexual assault and consent were, um, and that that conduct was illegal and what conduct was illegal. The primary issue was that PN continued to behave impulsively when he was in proximity to women. Um, so expert evidence was obtained in this case from Dr. Ince and from PN's social worker. Um, and the parties in the case all agreed that PN had capacity in the three um, areas that were of issue in this case. Dr. Ince was asked in oral evidence why, if, as he confirmed, PN can understand, retain and weigh the relevant information in relation to the decision to engage in sexual relations, um, he nevertheless sexually assaults women. Dr. Ince's view was that PN was able to use the relevant information, but that he chose to touch women, even though he knew they had not consented to him doing so. He said his impulsive actions are not a manifestation of his impairments, but are behaviours that stem from PN's character and outlook. He said he's not generally impulsive and there's no evidence that he acts on impulse in other fields of activity. So Dr. Ince does not accept that PN is overwhelmed by impulse due to his impairments. Uh, in this case, the judge applied the test from JB and considered other cases, including Hull and, F, uh, Hull and KF, which we've just discussed, um, where the court applied a test for sexual capacity, which was tailored to the individual circumstances of the person. The judge also considered that there was no history of PN being pre, uh, propositioned to engage in sexual activity, and PN did not fixate on any particular person. The evidence before him was that PN did understand, retain, and was able to use and weigh the bilateral nature of consent, and was able to do so even when he felt the impulse to touch a woman without her consent. Uh, the judge also took account of PN's apparent appreciation for the potential reprisals and criminal sanctions. So he knew it was illegal, he knew police would become involved, and he there was also evidence that he could control um, impulses in front of his siblings. Um, but the judge emphasised that the court must make the decisions currently be before it on the basis of the Mental Capacity Act. The judge also considered whether PN needed to be able to understand, retain, use and weigh information about the likely repercussions for him of sexually assaulting people, but noted PN had very few such repercussions. And also to the extent which the potentially harmful consequences to the other person of sexual assault or even rape should be part of the relevant information that P must be able to understand, retain and weigh or use in order to have capacity to make a decision to engage in sexual relations. Having considered all of those things, the judge concluded um, appreciating the difficulties for the carers in implementing the arrangements with Flo, he concluded that PN had capacity in all three areas. Um, this was consistent with lack of capacity to have non-sexual contact with others. And the court's decision on um, capacity should be coherent and provide clarity for carers and those responsible for acting in peace best interests. This was an interesting and careful judgment um, because the, co the court and parties both put weight on PN's ability to control his impulses in certain circumstances and his ability to use and weigh up information about the consequences of offending behaviour. Um, the judge also repeatedly cautioned against setting the bar for capacity too high and against succumbing to the protection imperative. The judgment is one which uh, recognises that inherent in autonomy is that people will sometimes use that freedom to make bad decisions or even decisions that harm others and the court of protection must be cautious not to equate poor decisions with an inability to make those decisions. Separately, it was also helpful that the judge in this case reiterated the need to approach questions of sexual capacity when they were before the Court of Protection by reference to the Mental Capacity Act and not by reference to criminal law. <clears throat> uh, the next case we're going to look at concerns um, Peter, who was 19 years old and had what is described as a troubled and abused life. Um, he presented as a significant risk to children and vulnerable adults as a result of his history of sexual offending. Um, 
Peter was diagnosed with ADHD, executive functioning difficulties and a learning disability, though he did not meet the criteria for autism. He was engaged with care planning, therapeutic work and education, but was considered to need long periods of time to learn new skills. Um, a number of capacity assessments were undertaken in relation to Peter's capacity, <clears throat> uh, including reports from clinical neuropsychiatrists, forensic psychologists and developmental psychiatrists. Uh, Peter had been convicted of committing a serious sexual offence against a young child when he was a teenager. Uh, he was made the subject of a sexual harm prevention order, which forbade him from being in the same premises as a child without supervision. He was made a looked after child under the Children's Act and placed in a residential educational placement. He was later moved to a support and living accommodation. Uh, at the time of this hearing, um, he had pending criminal charges. Um, Peter was in a relationship with Jenny, who he met at college and is described as a vulnerable person. They were never left on their own, um, despite them both wishing to have a sexual relationship with each other. Um, so the, the main issue in this case concerned Peter's capacity. The judge actually looked at his capacity in relation to a number of different decisions. However, for the purposes of today's webinar, I'm just going to focus on the decision around um, capacity to engage in sexual relations. Um, Peter was clear in his understanding that it was Jenny's decision whether or not she wished to have sex with him and that it would be wrong to have sex with an unconscious person because they could not consent. Uh, these questions were considered in the specific context of Peter's relationship with Jenny. Um, the judge in this case found that Peter understood what the physical acts of, of sexual relations consist of, and he understands that where there is sexual intercourse between a man and a woman, there is a risk that the woman could become pregnant without adequate protection. He also understands that sexually transmitted diseases exist and can be spread from the infected partner to another. This too can be ameliorated by the use of condoms and Peter also understands that consent is necessary on both sides. So he need not have sex if he does not wish to, equally neither should his partner. Um, however, the expert's evidence uh, raised concerns about Peter's lack of what she calls insight into his ability to control his behaviour and to stop himself from engaging in behaviour he knows is wrong. In her oral evidence on questioning, um, the expert focused on situations that Peter might find himself in when he might find it difficult to stop himself because of his sexual urges. This uh, caused some difficulty for the court. Uh, clearly, urges are, by their very nature, difficult to control, and it would be setting the bar too high if capacity to consent in sexual relations were to be ruled out because a person was unable to control an urge, for instance, to carry on with the sexual act. Having said that, Pete, Peter is a sexual offender who is unable to control his urges to engage in very harmful and criminal sexual behaviour, as the judge said he already found. Um, there was consideration about whether the sixth factor ought to be introduced to the JB test, namely to have insight into and the ability to control one's urges, but the judge ultimately rejected that this should be um, added. Uh, he concluded that Peter had capacity on the basis that ordinary risk-taking, which may be unwise, does not render the decision incapacitous. Uh, he went further and said that a person can have the capacity to engage in sexual relations, understanding that his partner may withdraw her consent at any moment, and that with that he must stop the sexual act. If, however, when that withdrawal of consent happens, the person is unable to overcome his urges, that has nothing to do with capacity to consent to sexual relations. Um, so essentially, this is a bit of a unique case, although quite similar in facts to PN, which we just discussed, because the judge is essentially concluding that urges or impulses or executive dysfunction should not be considered in relation to capacity to engage in sexual relations. Um, we do understand that this decision is currently being appealed, so do keep your eyes peeled for a further judgment or update on this case. 
The last couple of cases I'm just going to talk through are in relation to sexual relations and contraception and how those decisions work uh, together. Um, so EE e. was a 31 year old woman who was born with a genetic condition um, which caused benign tumours to develop in different parts of her body, including her brain. She was also diagnosed with autistic spectrum disorder, mild learning disability and emotionally unstable personality disorder and recurrent psychotic disorder. Um, she wanted to become pregnant and have a baby um, and that was the main issue to be considered in this case. The parties were ultimately in agreement that EE had capacity to make decisions to engage in sexual relations, but she lacked capacity to make decisions about contact with others. They were also looking at contraception and the local authority and the official solicitor agreed that, um, or were of the view that EE lacked capacity to make decisions about contraception. However, however there were slight differences in the formulation used to reach those decisions. Um, the local authority said she lacked capacity to make decisions about whether to use contraception, whereas the official solicitor uh, submitted she had capacity to make decisions about contraception. Um, so different formulations were used by the parties, um, which pointed to an important issue for the court to address namely what is the matter in relation to uh, contraception that EE has to decide. An expert was instructed in this case to assess each of the domains and also whether EE had capacity to make decisions regarding conceiving and becoming pregnant. The court carefully considered the relevant information for each of the domains assessed and whether there should have also been consideration of serious or grave risks to EE or her baby should she become pregnant. Ultimately, the court concluded that EE has capacity to make decisions to engage in sexual relations, lacks capacity to make decisions about contact with others, and specifically those with whom she is not yet familiar, and has capacity to make decisions about the use of contraception. It's important to note in this case that the judge did not make a conclusion in relation to EE's capacity to make decisions about conception. He considered whether it was appropriate to consider um, EE's capacity to decide to conceive or become pregnant alongside decisions about her capacity to engage in sexual relations and the use of contraception. And he decided that in some cases, conception will be a separate decision, but in most cases, including EE's separate consideration for capacity to decide about conceiving or conception is not required or justified. The final case we're just going to touch on is the case of CLF, who was a young female with diagnoses of learning disability, autistic spectrum disorder, ADHD, and potentially an emotionally unstable personality disorder. In 2020, CLF was made subject to a child protection plan and moved to a care placement. Um, this was an assessment unit with one, where she had one-to-one -one support at all times. There were concerns around her absconding, placing herself at risk with unsavoury individuals, um, having constant sexual partners, and um, also finding these individuals by using social media, which placed her at risk. CLF also had reported that she had been raped by somebody she had met on Snapchat, um, and that was subject to ongoing police investigation. The parties in this case agreed that CLF lacked capacity to conduct litigation and make decisions about care, contact and internet and social media. Um, but they disagreed about whether she had capacity to make decisions about residence, engaging in sexual relations and contraception. In relation to contraception, the parties ultimately agreed that um, she, uh, agreed on this domain, but the official solicitor said that it should only be uh, for an interim period to allow for education and then for a capacity to be reassessed. The official solicitor said that because CLF had been deemed to lack capacity about contraception, she lacked capacity about sexual relations. And so expert evidence was sought and was categoric that CLF had capacity in relation to sexual relations. Um, the judge made final declarations in this case um, that 
CLF lacked capacity to conduct proceedings, make decisions about residence care, contact with others, and the use of internet and social media. Um, I'll just quickly explore his decision in relation to engaging in sexual relations and contraception further. So one of the questions was, does CLF have capacity to make decisions about sexual relations? The judge considered that there was evidence CLF understands the concept of consent and recognises that sexual intercourse without consent is a criminal offence. She could describe the physical act of sexual intercourse, explain sexually transmitted infections and their potential risk, um, understood she can withdraw consent and there are times a person could not give consent. The judge found that CLF did understand that sex may result in pregnancy and could use and weigh the other in relevant information identified in the case of JB. Um, so he found that she had capacity to decide to engage in sexual relations. Uh, the second thing to consider was, does CLF have capacity in relation to contraception? Uh, the judge found that CLF could name types of contraception, but didn't appear to understand the side effects or any benefits of the same. She didn't understand the risk of pregnancy from certain birth control methods. And this was not a question of an unwise decision, but of understanding and the ability to weigh the information. Uh, CLF also believed that contraception medication made you infertile. Uh, the judge therefore found that presently, CLF lacked capacity to make decisions about contraception, um, but agreed to make this an interim declaration as um, there was evidence that a focused educational programme could lead her to gain capacity in this area. Um, so this judgment suggests capacity to make decisions about sexual relations and contraception should not be conflated. It was clarified that different findings in each of these areas are compatible. Um, and, and it reiterated that the bar should not be set too high for capacity in relation to sex. Um, and again, reiterated that uh, capacity for engaging in sexual relations can be person specific. Um, I will now hand you over to Emma, who will discuss the withdrawal of treatment cases. Thanks so much, Ellie, and good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about withdrawal of treatment cases um, involving children. So obviously, in terms of the court process, these fall under the inherent jurisdiction of the High Court, um, but there's a lot of overlap with the MCA and the Court of Protection in terms of consideration of best interests. And there's one particular case that I want to focus on today, which I'm sure many of you um, heard about last year. Uh, that's the case of Indy Gregory. Um, this was probably one of the most highly publicised children's cases of 2023. Um, I think there were, at last count, 21 articles on the BBC website alone and plenty more on many other news sites, um, some more reputable than others. Um, in summary, an absolutely tragic case, as these as these always are. Um, Indy was eight months old and she had mitochondria, which is a, a tragic disease. Um, it's irreversible. It was untreatable. And Indy had no prospect of improvement. Um, so it was just a really kind of downward trajectory for her. Um, she was on full life support. She was critically ill and very unstable and she was described as having an extremely limited quality of life. Um, I think what really struck me with this case is the, the level of pain that she suffered. So she experienced frequent pain multiple times a day as a result of the various medical interventions um, that were necessary to keep her alive. And she displayed reactions to that painful stimulus um, with crying, increased heart rate, wincing and gasping. Now, going on to look at the legal timeline, and there's, I appreciate there's quite a lot of detail here on the slide. Um, I would normally avoid going into too much detail about the legal side of things um, for risk of you all falling asleep. But I do think it's important in this case um, to put in context what I'll go on to say around the criticisms that the judges had. Um, and I also think it's worth bearing in mind as we go through this timeline, um, that concept of Indy being in pain kind of multiple times a day. Um, so we'll start with the 9th of October which was a hearing um, before Mr. Justice Peel. There would have obviously been various directions hearings before then, um, but this was the point where he considered best interests. 
and a few days later on the 13th of October um, his judgment was handed down and that judgment authorised the withdrawal of life-sustaining invasive treatment as being in Indy's best interests and he approved the hospital's care plan, so essentially a palliative care plan um, to allow withdrawal of treatment. And then on the 23rd of October, so this is 10 days later, um, the father had applied to the Court of Appeal for permission to appeal, appeal's <laughs> decision. Um, that's a bit of a tongue twister, that one. Um, that um, application for permission to appeal was refused after an oral application, which is the one that was heard on the 23rd of October. There was also an application made um, by the father to the European Court of Human Rights, um, which was declined as well around the same time. Um, and that's quite common for us to see those applications being made in these kind of proceedings, um, particularly when there are certain interest groups involved. Um, so in accordance with the care plan that the trust had prepared and that the court had authorised, the trust planned to proceed to extubation on the 27th of October, um, which was a Friday. They agreed to extend that to, I think it was 12pm on the Monday, so this would have been the 30th of October. Um, and that was in order to meet the parents' wishes for Indy to um, be transferred to a hospice before extubation took place. And then this is where things start to unravel slightly. Um, so rather surprisingly, on the morning of the 30th of October, um, the father's newly instructed solicitor emailed the parties providing various medical reports and letters and asking the trust to agree to Indy being transferred to Rome. And later that day, a formal application was made to the court for Indy's care to be transferred to other medical professionals. Um, the, on the 31st of October, there was therefore a further hearing before Mr Justice Peel, and that application was opposed by both the Trust and the Guardian. So the Guardian in this case is, is representing Indy's interests, and I think both of them were concerned about the, the pain that Indy was in um, on a sort of, on a frequent daily basis. So Mr Peel, uh, Mr Justice Peel considered that application and was very clear that nothing he had seen or heard in terms of the additional medical reports and letters that had been provided had none, none of that had led him to question the conclusions that he had previously reached. So this is back on the 9th of October with judgment handed down on the 13th about what was in Indy's best interests. And he said that there was no compelling new medical evidence to justify him revisiting that decision. He was also satisfied that a transfer to Rome would not be in Indy's best interests and may well prolong her pain and suffering. So then on the, um, so that was then handed down on the 2nd of November. And then on the 4th of November, um, the Court of Appeal refused permission to appeal um, Peel's <laughs> decision um, that he'd made around the transfer to Rome. And by their order, the stay on the implementation of the care plan was due to expire at 2 p.m. on, this is another Monday, the 6th of November. So at 2 p.m. on that Monday, the stay that had been in place in terms of being able to implement the care plan was due to expire. Then, um, and again, a sort of rather frantic Monday morning, I'm sure, for the parties involved. About two hours before the expiration of the stay, the parents emailed the judge um, saying they'd had no response about Indy transferring home from the trust. The trust replied saying that this was no longer appropriate because unfortunately Indy had deteriorated so much since the initial um, decision was made about what was in her best interests. Um, there was then a hearing that day, so this is still the Monday, the 6th of November, I think it's about 3pm, they had a hearing and then evidence was provided overnight with a further hearing the following morning, so the Tuesday, the 7th of November. And I think it's important to note here and, and really quite sad that one of the reasons why withdrawal at home was no longer an option was because of the delays in the legal proceedings um, caused by the various appeals that the parents had made, uh, which was you know, really unfortunate. 
Um, the judge agreed essentially with the trust and agreed to amend the care plan so that withdrawal would be in either a hospital or hospice um, and extubation was then due to take place the following day after judgment was handed down. Um, so judgment was handed down on the 8th and then on the 9th um, extubation was due to take place. Then on the 10th of November, um, another application been made for permission to appeal, um, appeals decision, and it was um, a court of appeal hearing on the 10th um, about that, which I will go into detail um, in on the next slide. Um, but then just to finally note, um, on the 13th of November, treatment was withdrawn and Indy passed away. And that was a month after the decision had been made that treatment, the ongoing treatment was not in her best interests essentially, and that it was in her best interest for treatment to be withdrawn. So moving on then to what the um, court had to say in the Court of Appeal in that sort of final hearing, um, the judges in the Court of Appeal concluded that the grounds of appeal were entirely without merit and they raised concerns about the conduct of the parents' legal team. Um, so it was Lord Justice Peter Jackson who acknowledged that sort of on the face of it, the parents were appealing the decision about where withdrawal should take place. Um, but he found that in reality, what the parents were doing um, were taking steps to prevent the court's decision um, so that decision about best interest made a month ago um, from being carried into effect at all. And the media reports from the hearing suggest that Lord Justice Peter Jackson queried whether the trainee solicitor acting on the father's behalf was out of control when he made another apparent attempt to persuade Peel to reopen the welfare decision during, I think this was during a break in the Court of Appeal hearing, um, and the judgment included a warning that they would take whatever action seems appropriate in due course. Uh, the judgment also addressed an issue of Italian citizenship that had arisen. Um, there'd been a request made, made by an Italian consular official that he be authorised to exercise jurisdiction over Indy. Um, and that was said to be made under Article 9.1 of the 1996 Hague Convention. Um, for the protection of children and that article basically permits this kind of request where the requesting authority consider that they are better placed to assess a child's best interests. Uh, Lord Justice Peter Jackson was having absolutely none of it. He stated um, the argument that the Italian authorities are better able than the English court to determine Indy's best interests is in our view wholly misconceived and a request of this nature is clearly contrary to the spirit of this important international convention. And finally, the judgment concludes with a warning to those representing families in these really difficult cases. Um, it said, and I think this is worth reading out, the increasing demands and changing positions of the parents have been extremely challenging for the clinicians who have not only to look after Indy but 12 other critically ill children on the ward. The highest professional standards are rightly expected of lawyers practicing in this extremely sensitive area. The court will not tolerate manipulative litigation tactics designed to frustrate orders that had been made after anxious consideration in the interests of children, interests that are always central to these grave decisions. So really quite striking words there. And I think it's very helpful for us to have such a clear indication from the judiciary that these kind of tactics will not be tolerated. Um, unfortunately, we've seen them a lot in these kind of cases. I really cannot begin to imagine what this must be like for the parents and the families involved. Um, obviously, from our perspective, um, acting for the NHS trusts, our primary focus is on our clinicians and we really do see firsthand the toll that these cases take on clinicians. So that's both in terms of the amount of time they take um, and you know this is time that clinicians don't easily have, um, you know they're fitting all of this in around their clinical duties 
um, but also it's the emotional impact that they have. Um, and, you know, I have heard of cases where medical, prof medical professionals have left the profession following one of these cases, um, particularly the nurses, um, I think because, you know, they're understandably there day in, day out, kind of at the bedside, um, that, you know, these cases basically um, are too much for them and they end up leaving the profession, which is, was incredibly sad. Um, and I think it's really, there's so much more of a role for us to play here than being a traditional lawyer. Um, you know, it's an absolute given that we will get the law right and give good advice and, um, you know, advise on strategy and help keep costs down and all the rest of it. Um, what often comes into play here just as much is playing a really supportive role for those clinicians, which I think is incredibly important. And actually most of the feedback that we get from the clinicians is how grateful they are for the support and that side of it. Um, you know, obviously that's a part of our role that we play, but I do also think it's something worth thinking about in terms of what the trust can offer internally and making sure that every clinician that has to be involved in one of these tragic cases um, has got that support there. Um, they've got someone that they can talk to um, within the trust as well, um, whenever they need. I think these cases are already difficult enough for everyone involved. Um, and then when you have certain interest groups that also get involved, um, possibly with their own agendas, things can become much more protracted, much more highly publicised, and that's not good for anyone, um, most importantly the child at the centre of these matters. So I think that's worth, worth bearing in mind. And then just moving on, there's just two other points that I want to make that link in with these um, these children's cases. So the first is the very, very long overdue um, criminal and civil legal aid amendment regulations, um, which came, finally came into force last summer. And they've basically removed means testing to allow for legal representation for parents or those with parental responsibility for a child under the age of 18 who's facing withdrawal or withholding of life-sustaining treatment. So, as I said, long overdue. It's obviously brilliant that it's now in place. Um, and I hope that means we'll see less reliance on interest groups going forwards. Um, but we need to see that extended to the court of protection, the kind of adult withdrawal of treatment cases as well for their families. And then last but not least, I'm just going to try and get my picture to come up. There we go. Um, the Nuffield review was something that I wanted to flag. So this was about disagreements in the care of critically ill children. So obviously absolutely key to these kind of withdrawal of treatment cases. And it was, I think it was December 2022. So a while ago now, um, the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care commissioned the Nuffield to undertake an independent review of disagreements that arise in the care of critically ill children in England. And Nuffield published their, their report, um, it's a fairly quick turnaround, um, in September 2023, essentially encouraging the government to act on the recommendations that they've made. It's definitely worth a read, it's not too lengthy. Um, as part of the review, they interviewed lots of families and clinicians that get involved in these kind of disputes. And it does give some really useful insight into the family perspective as well as the clinical perspective. Um, I think unsurprisingly, one of the key themes that comes up is around communication. Um, so between the clinical teams and the family, um, that does often in our experience tend to be one of the, the key issues with, with these cases, um, you know, not through, not through lack of trying. Um, and it also reiterates the need to keep families informed about potential court proceedings and give them as much notice as possible. There's a sort of recurring theme that comes through of families feeling like they've been caught off guard um, when it comes to the, the proceedings. So there's another reason there to, um, to flag these kind of cases to your legal teams internally as soon as possible and to make sure you know, if you're within the legal teams, making sure that you've got really clear processes in place so that people know how to flag and raise these issues at a really early stage so that you can get involved and look at things like med mediation, whether there's anything else that we can do to avoid going to court. And if not, and if court is inevitable, then keeping the family really updated um, in the hopes that they'll be able to get their own legal representation um, from you know, a sensible law firm.
Um, I was actually, I had the opportunity of discussing the review with one of the kind of key researchers involved in it. And interestingly, she said that she did not get the impression from all these interviews that they were doing that the families were pushing for the significant harm test um, to replace the best interest test. So that would be the suggestion that the court should only intervene when parents' decision making carries a significant risk of harm to the child rather than the current process of the court looking at what's in best interest. So a significantly higher threshold um, for the court to become involved. Um, but yeah, that wasn't felt to be something that families were, were pushing for, or at least the ones that were spoken to as part of this review. Um, the recommendations they put forward, there's about 15 of them. They all seem perfectly sensible, um, but I think the real question will be whether they'll be acted upon by the various government departments and membership organisations and NHS England. Um, I just wanted to pull out um, some of the key ones which are very specific to NHS trusts. So ensuring the clinical team um, culture prioritises relationship building with the family. Ensuring emotional and psychological support for treating teams. So that kind of goes back to what I was saying before about um, the kind of supportive element of the role that we play as external lawyers, um, but the need to also ensure that there's adequate support from internally within the trust, because these cases do have a huge impact on clinicians. You know, it's often one of the most challenging parts of their career. Um, so really worth thinking about what support you can put in place or make sure you've got in place. Um, and then the recommendation to ensure quick access to medical records. So I think there's a need to recognise that there's considerably more urgency with these cases um, than there would be with you know, your standard subject access request. So providing those records within a week rather than the usual month window um, is really important. And I think it's, it's a case of making sure the relevant teams within your trust know about that. Um, so if you've got a kind of subject access request information governance type team, um, are they able to spot when when a request comes in that might actually be to do with a withdrawal of treatment case and therefore kind of escalate and prioritise that accordingly. Um, and then finally, once a trust has decided to go to court, they should inform the family within, within three days of making that decision. Um, so again, it's just about keeping families informed and updated so that they don't feel caught off guard. Um, but as I said, really worth, really worth a read. Um, it's not too lengthy. So that is it from me on children um, and withdrawal of treatment. And I will pass over to my wonderful colleague, Claire. Thanks, Claire. Thank you, Emma. That was really interesting. Um, so moving on then to COP applications. And there has been um, a bit of a flurry of judgments over the last six months or so where applicants making these applications have been criticised in some way for either the way that they've brought the application or some conduct during the application. So I'm just going to take you through um, some of those judgments over the last six months or so, just to help you um, essentially to avoid doing the same and to highlight some sort of best practice points that we can all use moving forward as well. So the, the first case is X nhs Foundation Trust and RH. Um, so this was an application brought by the NHS Trust in relation to RH, who was a 40-year-old man detained under Section 3 of the Mental Health Act, um, and he had a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And um, he had a renal condition, and he required um, urological investigations and potentially surgery following um, that investigation as well. Um, and RH did not want to have the procedure. He did not think that there was anything wrong with him. Um, he had delusions that um, clinicians were trying to steal his kidneys. Um, and so he was assessed as lacking capacity to make those decisions for himself and the trust brought the application for best interest declarations. And I mean, ultimately, the application was brought, was was granted by the court. But I just want to highlight some of the issues um, procedurally in the way that the application was brought. And it, it was described as, as a haphazard application. And you do get that sense from from reading through the from reading through the judgments. Um, I think where it started to go wrong was right from the beginning um, when they filed the application and they overstated the true urgency of the application. And it's something that, you know, 
can easily be done. You've got clinicians telling you that that they need to have surgery within a certain time period, or there's these risks of um, that might materialise. Um, in this particular case, um, the trust filed the application with an email marked as urgent and requesting a hearing within between two and five days. Otherwise, RH was considered to be at risk of death. And as a result of um, stating how urgent it was, the court set a very tight timetable for the trust to file further evidence and then for an urgent hearing. Um, as it transpired later on um, in the hearing, it wasn't quite that urgent. Um, the trust had stated that it was urgent because they didn't want to get to a point where they were then in an emergency situation and then requiring an urgent hearing. Um, but it certainly seems to have been the case that it wasn't quite as urgent as they stated it at the beginning. And had they given themselves a little bit more time, given the court a little bit more time, the issues that happened thereafter might have been avoided as well. So it's just really important to be um, very transparent with the court um, at the point of issue in setting out the why it's urgent and the reasons for the urgency um, and, and truly how quickly the hearing needs to be listed. And so, as I said, some, after that, the trust didn't comply with directions to file witness evidence and a position statement on time. Um, the position statement of the trust was filed very shortly before the hearing, which then subsequently impacted on the ability of the official solicitor to conduct her investigations and to properly represent RH. There were also issues around um, incomplete disclosure of medical records. And perhaps most importantly, throughout the hearing, um, even when it commenced, the care plan had not yet been finalised. So the court adjourned the hearing in the morning to allow additional time for that to happen. And an updated care plan was then filed. But the difficulty was that witnesses were then giving evidence who hadn't in fact seen that final care plan and they were being asked questions about it. So um, really important, if at all possible, to get everything finalised, make sure every witness has seen it before giving evidence in court. Um, and ultimately, the judge said that all of this had impacted on the court's ability to determine the case, the official solicitor's ability to present her position as litigation friend um, for RH, and ultimately ended up adjourning the hearing so that everybody had a little bit more time. Um, so essentially, that's a sort of what not to do list there. Um, the second recent case is a hospital NHS Foundation Trust and KL. Um, and this um, was a 45 year old woman um, with learning disabilities and emotionally unstable personality disorder. And she was detained under Section 3 of the Mental Health Act at a privately owned hospital. And she had been diagnosed with leukemia and she had been admitted to the acute NHS hospital under Section 17 leave um, for chemotherapy. Um, she didn't want the chemotherapy. And so um, there was a question around her capacity to make that decision and the need to bring an application to the Court of Protection for Best Interest declarations. There isn't a lot of detail about this particular point in the judgment. It's really just um, sort of some closing comments at the end. But there is a comment that there seems to have been some delay in bringing the application because of a dispute between the owner of the private mental health hospital and the NHS Trust as to who should make the application. It's not clear how much of a delay there was, but obviously any delay in this kind of situation is is best avoided um, and the judge because I don't think that he really went in to investigate it and there was no evidence on it and in fact the, the private hospital was not in the end a party to these proceedings but he did say this which I think is is important I do not propose to comment on the dispute between the applicant and the X group other than to observe that no public body or private institution tasked with caring for vulnerable people should compromise their charges welfare through a lack of cooperation. So I just take that as a sort of warning from the judge to for public bodies or an NHS trust in a privately owned hospital 
to avoid um, causing any prejudice to the care of those in their care um, by a dispute over who should bring an application. And it's not unusual to have these disagreements at the outset of a case. We often see them in um, doll cases as well when there's a disagreement as to whether it's the local authority or the ICB as to who should bring an application or who should lead on an application. Um, but I think it is best, if at all possible, for those disagreements to be resolved behind the scenes and not to let that delay bringing an application or progressing an application in any way, because the judges will not will not look kindly on it. Um, also in this particular case, it was another case where the trust after filing the application had not complied with the court's directions on time and they had filed additional witness statements without permission to do so and without making an application. Um, and ultimately the judge said that this had obscured the court's focus on the welfare and safety of KL and led the judge to be concerned for her welfare. And as a result of those concerns, he listed a review hearing after the best interest decision was made to make sure that KL's best interests were being properly managed. So that's a hearing that potentially would not have been otherwise required. And so there's additional time and costs involved in that because of the earlier failures to comply with the court's directions. So just important to, to bear in mind that the court orders do have to be complied with. And in court proceedings, sometimes statements do get filed without permission, but strictly speaking, we should be filing a, a COP9 application with those statements to ask the court's permission to rely on them. And um, the next case is a slightly different one. So this isn't about um, best practice in making the application at the outset, but actually about how to seek final declarations or when it might be appropriate to seek final declarations at a case management hearing. And VT, um, was a successful appeal against final decisions made in respect of VT's care and residence arrangements at a case management hearing. And what appears to have happened is that the parties attended pre-hearing discussions about an hour before the hearing was meant to commence. And the ICB informed the other parties that they actually intended to ask the court to make final declarations at what was just meant to be a directions hearing or a case management hearing. And the judge actually accepted the ICB's position, um, decided to make the final declaration sought. Um, and VT, via her litigation friend, the official solicitor, appealed that decision and that, and that appeal was upheld um, on the basis that the judge didn't have enough evidence before him to make that decision. And also it hadn't been procedurally fair to do so. Um, and helpfully, what the appeal judge, Mrs. Justice Arbuthnot, did was give some guidance on when it might be appropriate to make final declarations at an interim hearing. And so this helps us moving forward if you're in a situation where you think, actually, we don't need any further investigation of these issues. We've got enough here um, for the judge to make final declarations at this hearing and, and, and bring an end to the proceedings. And so just briefly, I mean, the, the Court of Protection rules are quoted within the judgment, um, which refers to the overriding objective, which does include dealing with cases justly and at proportional, proportionate cost. And so any case needs to be dealt with fairly, has to ensure that P's best interests are properly considered, and as I said, has to be proportionate to the nature of the issues. Um, and the court has a duty to actively manage cases on its own initiative, or it can do so on application by a party. So it's everybody's responsibility, essentially, to, to make sure that the court is um, dealing with things proportionately and deciding promptly which issues need a full investigation and a hearing and which do not. And um, the Court of Protection doesn't have an express power to give summary judgment, but such powers do exist by virtue of Rule 2.5, which provides for application of the civil procedure rules, which do have summary judgment um, within it. Um, so it is possible for the Court of Protection to decide matters of its own motion or an application of the parties, to decide which issues need 
full investigation and a hearing in which do not, and to exclude any issues from consideration. Um, but the two key questions in deciding whether the court can do so is, does the court have sufficient information and can the determination be reached in a procedurally fair manner? And there's just some sort of tips on here that come out of this judgment um, that might help you answer those two questions in your own cases moving forward. Um, the first is whether sufficient notice can be given to the parties. So in VT's case, um, it was clear that sufficient notice meant more than one hour before the hearing. Um, and the judge also helpfully notes that if you've got a case where an earlier final hearing might be contemplated, then consider including a recital to that effect in an earlier directions order. And that can then serve as notice to the parties and, and evidence to the court that that notice has been given. Um, consider whether having a final, de final determination earlier might alter the evidence that is put before the court. And as I said before, it's important to take a proportionate approach to the issues. And finally, to ensure that P's interests are properly considered, particularly where you're dealing with fundamental rights and freedoms, such as in VT's case, where it was concerning her deprivation of, of liberty. And finally, um, going to the case of Re G H, which is about delay. Um, and delay is an issue that we see over and over again in, in cases. Sometimes it is just unavoidable, um, no matter what you do to try and move things along. But there's a couple of cases um, where um, trusts in particular have been criticised for not bringing applications far enough in advance of a proposed medical procedure. We often see it in obstetrics cases where applications to authorise caesarean sections are brought too close to the proposed um, date of the procedure. And GH was not an obstetrics case, but it was um, a case involving um, treatment. And GH had been diagnosed with breast cancer in March 2023. She denied having cancer and refused treatment um, she was assessed as lacking capacity to make that decision and the treating trust for her cancer care brought an application to the Court of Protection for best interest declarations. The issue really was that the, the trust didn't bring the application until September 2023 and that was despite discussions about a COP application having started in May 2023. And because of that delay, the application was then put on the urgent applications list, um, which then affects the time that the official solicitor in particular has to investigate and represent um, GH. And because of that, um, the official solicitor sought an order for the trust to pay 100% of her costs. Um, the trust opposed the application. They cited factors that will be used to to hearing about such as sick leave of relevant clinicians, lack of control over the evidence from GHE's psychiatrist who was employed by a different trust, and uncertainty around GHE's capacity and the need to bring the application at all. Um, but the court did agree with the official solicitor that the delay was unjustified. There's some legislation and procedural rules there around cost orders in court protection proceedings. Essentially, in short, the court has a discretion on costs. The general rule in court protection welfare proceedings is that there is no order for costs, but the court does have discretion to depart from that um, for various reasons, including due to the conduct of the parties and the manner in which the application is made. And so, as I said, the judge agreed with the official solicitor that the delay was unjustified. He highlighted there um, the effect this had had on the role of the official solicitor, the pressure on the court, um, the fact that it had undermined open justice because the application was not put on the public list because of the lateness of the application. And perhaps most importantly, the fact that this had contributed to a delay in treating 
um, GH because she didn't receive treatment until seven months post diagnosis. Um, the trust was ordered to pay 80% of the official solicitor's costs rather than the 100% that the official solicitor had sought. Bear in mind in these cases as well that the usual convention is that the trust would ordinarily pay 50% in any event. That's not court ordered, that's a convention between um, trusts in serious medical treatment cases and the official solicitor. So it's an additional 30% on what they would normally have paid. Just finally, to say that delay doesn't always necessarily equal cost sanctions. Um, the judgment on the screen there, West Hertfordshire Hospitals and AX, was quite a helpful one in making clear that even when a delay is unjustified, even when a trust has not complied with the relevant guidance to bring an application four weeks prior to a proposed um, procedure, that does not necessarily mean that they should pay additional cost to the official solicitor. Um, and what the judge in this case said is that there's no suggestion in the case itself, and the case he's referring to there is in FG, where Kean um, gave guidance that um, applications in relation to obstetrics treatment should be made four weeks in advance of the proposed treatment. Um, he said there's no suggestion in that case that the breach of the guidance automatically justifies a cost order against the applicant. Something more is needed. Um, it is incorrect that the only way a court can express its disapproval of a party's conduct of a case is by making a cost order. It can be expressed in a judgment and the court's views of the applicant's actions in this case should be tolerably clear. So in that case, the official solicitor has suggested that the only way that the court can sort of um, set, you know, teach the trust a lesson and, and express its disapproval is to make a cost order against it. But the judge here is saying, no, actually, we can simply say in the judgment um, how unacceptable and unjustified this is. It doesn't necessarily mean that additional costs are warranted. And that's me. So I will pass over to Amy and we'll try and pick up on some of your questions. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, we do have um, a few questions and I've had a look and sort of grouped them um, conscious we've got a few minutes left. So perhaps if I um, start with the questions um, that relate to capacity around sexual relations and some of the case law. Um, there's a couple there um, really, or, or a couple of themes. One interesting question, um, which is, uh, does this case law mean that the courts should reach even further into our bedrooms, which is a sort of wider, um, you know, consideration, obviously thinking about that domain relates to other people involved who are not having their capacity assessed as well as pay themselves. Um, but, but also um, some other questions around um, perhaps trying to get uh, your head around the fact that someone may have capacity to um, have sexual relations, but not in relation to contact or vice versa, and may have capacity in relation to sexual relations, but not in relation to contraception. So the idea that, you know, you might get differing conclusions on capacity in relation to these different domains and how that can be, um, I suppose, uh, managed, you know, uh, on a kind of practical level. So Ellie, Rachel, I don't know if you've got any sort of thoughts on, on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is very difficult. I've looked at the questions and I think, you know, largely you, you're quite right to raise these points because it is, there's no hard and fast rule, I would say, specifically mm -hmm. from the case law. You know, we see the lists of relevant information and they're not exhaustive and it's all going to be very fact specific if cases are brought. And I think that in terms of these capacity assessments, it just means how carefully they do have to be considered Mm. And again, if there is going, the court will look at each case and what relevant information should be considered. I would say, as, as I've said, the list isn't exhaustive. Um, yeah. And we may see more things come in depending on how, how cases are brought. Mm. Ellie, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on. No, I, I agree. I think I think it, it's 
It is difficult because the courts keep reiterating that they're very person-specific decisions and matter-specific decisions. So it, it depends on the circumstances for P in that case at that time. Um, so I think the KF case, it, it, they, they were considering contact with her ex-partner and sexual relations with her ex-partner um, rather than more generally and broadly. Um, mm. So I think that's why it was sort of decided that she could have contact with him, but that would be supervised in her best interest rather than um, unsupervised contact and then ultimately sexual relations. So I think I think it's it's difficult to to sort of say that there's a, a broad approach because it's so fact and person specific. Mm. And, and of course, course, the official solicitor is involved to represent P's interests and to advocate on their behalf as to what they really consider relevant, the relevant information should and can be. Mm, yeah, and it's, I think for capacity to have sex, the test, the bar is quite low, isn't it? Um, you could probably say, so whereas the other domains are higher, so you can get these situations where someone may lack capacity to have contact because of everything that can come with that, but does in relation to, to sex, and then you're looking at having a sort of care plan around that to facilitate you know relationships where possible and, and empower the person to to have them but but still obviously having a care plan around it and um, sort of on a practical level um mm -hmm. but yeah very much sort of case specific as i think all the cases you've highlighted show um absolutely um thank you both so i'm just going to move on um to some questions that are sort of directed at Emma and, and your your session there on the Indy Gregory case. And I think you've had a look, haven't you, and sort of grouped those together to hopefully be able to answer those questions around some of the sort of implications and practicalities um, when it comes to these, these difficult cases. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Amy, and thanks for all the, the really interesting questions. I'm going to try and fly through them because um, I'm conscious of time. Um, there was one about where the legal team was from in Indy's case. I've checked what's um, publicly <laughs> documented, so I don't want to get myself in trouble. Um, and it's Bruno Quantavalli, who was the barrister for them. Um, he's been involved in a lot of these cases. Um, Asaya Hastrup. Um, Archie Battersby, he was involved in, and I suspect there's probably a, a lot more, um, many other cases where he's involved, so slightly more behind the scenes, um, but he's part of various pro-life groups, and there's also an Italian kind of pro-life network, I think it's called Lawyers for Life or something like that, um, who seem to, to get involved in a lot of these cases, which is why we often end up with these um, suggestions of transfers to Rome and Italian Italian hospitals. Um, it does also say on the, the judgment that the solicitors firm is Andrew Storch Solicitors, but the particular trainee in question, who isn't named, so I won't name them, um, but they're not on the Andrew Storch website or anything. Um, but my understanding is that they're the same, um, the same individual that represented the family in the Alfie Evans case. Um, and it's quite interesting if you go back to Hayden's judgment in that, and I was just pulling it up. Um, this particular individual was described by Hayden as a fanatical and deluded young man whose submissions to the court were littered with bile that was inconsistent with the real interests of the parents' case. Um, and there's quite a lot from there around, around him. Um, my understanding was that he was behind the attempt from Alfie's parents to pursue a private prosecution for murder against the, um, the older Hay doctors in that case. Um, so yeah, so that's the that's the legal team um, that we were dealing with here. Um, there was also a question about the Charlotte Wyatt case from 2005. Um, yes, fairly similar, and also much more recently, um, the Pippa Knight case, which I was involved in, um, which I think was 2020. Um, mm -hmm. In that one, we had similar pro-life groups involved um, behind the scenes, and there were all sorts of applications being made. So you start seeing things like applications to the European Court of Human Rights, applications to the United Nation, um, the sort of disabilities convention group that they've got there. Um, with Pippa Knight, we even had a royal prerogative of mercy request to the Queen being made. Um, so there's all these different legal routes that are attempted and it doesn't seem to matter. I think the question was about um, whether previous decisions would be taken into account. Mm. The, the difficulty is if those legal routes are available to a family to pursue, 
yeah. they will pursue them whether or not it's failed a hundred times before so whilst yeah. those routes remain available um you know if tactically what the families want to do here is delay things then they will pursue all those avenues um mm. so unfortunately having previous decisions where it's clear that the european court of human rights isn't getting involved the united nations isn't getting involved the queen certainly not getting involved that doesn't seem to actually have any impact on them continuing to use these kind of tactics um but what i hope will happen from that judgment that we've we've recently had from the court of appeal is that they may think twice about how they do this um mm. because yeah there could potentially be some some sanctions from the court going forwards and i know there were questions raised in alfie evans about what qualifications the trainee solicitor had um so yeah that was the Charlotte Wyatt question and then very quickly um yes yeah, so there's one about manipulative litigation and how we um I think it was how we manage this um so yeah all really good questions yeah and another question in around practical advice for handling you know those challenging cases yeah. where communication is perhaps broken down um absolutely so i think in terms of the manipulative litigation tactics there is a fairly small and i have to be a bit careful about what i say but there's a very fairly small pool of individuals that we constantly see coming up in these cases and a lot of those tactics are stemming from that pool of individuals who hopefully with this last judgment will um sort of consider things slightly more carefully um i think the nuffield review part of the intention of that was to try and help um resolve some of these issues and stop them becoming quite so contentious so looking at the recommendations that they've made um but as i said before they're all very sensible recommendations i think the real question is going to be whether they are actually implemented mm. and a lot of them involve essentially additional resources being required so you know one of the key ones is putting more time into communicating with the families and developing those relationships which is all well and good and you know a perfectly reasonable suggestion but where are our clinicians finding the time to do that mm. amongst mm. everything else you know the pressures on the nhs at the moment are so intense that i i think it's really really difficult and there's not there you know there aren't particularly easy answers to that one but the nuffield mm. review would be would be the place Good to start. Good starting point. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. hopefully the legal aid changes as well will make a difference yeah, because sure. it means there should be less reliance on these pro-life groups where you can then get these certain yeah. individuals involved and um we can have sort of very sensible legal teams giving yeah. good advice to parents about where to draw the line. Um there was sure. also a question about sanctions. Um yeah, no sanctions as such that I'm aware of that have come out of it. I mean, I I certainly wouldn't want to be that training. I would be absolutely mortified. Mm. Um but yeah, no sanctions that I that I know of at this stage. Um and then there was also a question on mediation and the use of medi- whether mediation has a role to play in these cases. Um and I certainly think there is a role for mediation to play. Um I think if it's utilized at the right stage, it can make a real difference. Um but often it happens too late in the day um so yeah. so the trusts have you know the trusts are meant to be offering mediation in, in all of these cases um what i've seen with at least a couple of my more recent ones is that the trust will offer it at a fairly early stage and the families will decline um mm. quite you know quite often if there's very strong religious beliefs involved it feels like a tick box exercise for them because they know their views aren't going to change and they know the clinician's views aren't going to change either um so they will decline and then it's only at a much later stage where they've got legal representation and we're going through proceedings that they then say actually no we would now like mediation yeah and that that comes with various challenges of trying to run mediation in parallel alongside court, court proceedings but equally not wanting to delay the proceedings anymore because by then clinicians feel like there's already been quite a bit of delay um so it, yeah it's really difficult i think there certainly is a role for it um but we need to be trying to get in there earlier to suggest yeah. it because i think you know it could make a world of difference um mm. but often what i'm seeing is when mediation gets involved it's it's almost too late in terms of that communication breakdown so yeah trying sure. to get it in there so- sooner would be really yeah. key and i Great. think that was everything i think it for was me. and I think we have covered had a couple of, of other s- since yeah no you have emma thank you um I'm conscious for a few minutes overdue but there was one question which um claire is is picking up which is around the recent um gup case um and um claire i think you have a, a word with you on that just before we wrap up 
Yeah, I do. I was going to include it in these slides, but I started drafting the slides and realized I was going to talk about it for about an hour about it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot of, to say, isn't there? There's a lot to say. And it's one of those cases that's kind of um, got under my skin a little bit, as I think it has with, with a lot of people. Just for the benefit of those who, who don't know what it is, just very briefly, Reed GUP was a case decided, I think just last month, um, by Mr Justice Hayden, where... Uh, a trust was criticised essentially for not bringing an application um, around a decision not to give a patient nutrition. So the patient had had a stroke, had very poor neurological recovery, and um, there was essentially no feasible way to give her nutrition. and She wasn't receiving nutrition. This was clinically assisted nutrition, I should say. Um, at the time the application was brought because it couldn't actually be delivered it wasn't an option and the trust didn't bring the application for that reason it it wasn't an option and it wasn't something the court could make a best interest decision about but the court was the court and also the official solicitor essentially criticized the trust for that approach um because it meant that the son um of the patient had to bring the application himself he mm. was a literate person he wasn't represented and it was all a bit of a sort of procedural mess for that reason. Um, and what Mr Justice Hayden essentially said was, with reference to the medical treatment guidance, these applications need to be brought to court so that um, the court can, I think his words were sort of scrutinise the decision-making process mm -hmm. and consider the patient's best interests. But of course, the guidance around medical treatment disputes only applies when it is a best interest decision, i.e. when there are available options for the court to choose between. Mm -hmm. um, so there's been quite a lot of legal debate about whether that judgment is correct, how it affects the, the, tr the sort of guidance around when you have to bring these applications. Um, we have drafted an article on it. I hope that it might be out this week and so we might be able to attach it as part of our sort of feedback and materials yeah. to those who have attended this session, which you'll get an email about. Um, so hopefully we can attach it on there. But in short, my view is that that case does not change the guidance that the trust should not have to bring applications when there is no available option for the court to make a best interest decision about, um, because that's, that's the court protections role and it doesn't have the power to order clinicians to provide any particular treatment options. There's higher authority um, from the Supreme Court that confirms that principle. And so there was no way in that case that Mr Justice Hayden could have ordered the trust to provide nutrition because they weren't willing to provide it. Yeah. So it was a sort of pointless exercise of going through the best interests um, decision-making process. Um, others may have a different view. So obviously there is a risk that trusts might be criticised if they don't bring applications in these circumstances, and that's something we have to be mindful of. Um, mm. But that's that's my two pence, at least, on it. And if I if I can just add my two pence as well, I yeah. I agree completely with Claire on this. I think the there's a real there was already a real difficulty in that fine line between what is clinical appropriateness and clinical inappropriateness versus what is a best interest decision. That's mm. often something that clinicians sort of struggle to grasp in terms mm. of what the what the difference is quite understandably. And I think this judgment has unfortunately caused more confusion around that. Um, yeah. But it will be a case of making sure there are those really early discussions with the clinicians where we're really bottoming out. Is this an option on the table that you feel is not in their best interests or is it actually not an option at all because it's clinically appropriate and it's not something we're willing to offer and that that yeah. is a difficult conversation to have and it will be very fact specific um yeah. but just making sure we're having those conversations early early on absolutely thank you both can i also just add um for anyone that is interested in the case law updates and things, please do make sure you're following us all on LinkedIn because we do quite regular case law updates where we'll publish the judgments and give you a little bit of a summary around them and what they mean. Um, so if you're not already, come and connect with us on LinkedIn. Yeah, and they're usually hot off the press as well. Yeah, Thank you they to, try, to, we try to you and make both. Them so <laughs> nice you're very, very good at these <laughs> case law updates. I must recommend them. Um, yeah. So I think that draws us to a close now.
thank you for everyone for attending and thank you very much for your contributions within the q a box hopefully we managed to answer the majority of them i know we've run quite a bit over so apologies if we haven't managed all i know some of you have just made some comments as well that you'd like us to consider and that's very very helpful mm. just to flag to you again as i did at the beginning there is a feedback form that should come up and we do really appreciate your feedback so if you could um fill that in for us that would be great but otherwise thank you for attending and we hope to see you again at one of these events soon Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Good to see you all. Take care.